morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Catalyst webinar series presented by the Education Committee for the Southern California PGA. The Catalyst webinar series is a bi-weekly educational platform for creating success and change in your club and career. Our presenter, this is our first Catalyst webinar of the 2021 calendar year, and uh, it's become kind of a, a tradition for Craig Kessler of the SCGA uh, to, uh, to kick off the year for us on the Catalyst side. He's also been on the PGA Chats quite a bit. But the, those of you that know Craig, he is the uh, Director of Governmental Affairs for the SCGA. He's been in that title for the past 11 years. Prior to that, he was the Executive Director for the Public Links Golf Association. Good morning, Craig. How are you today? Welcome to the Catalyst Webinar Series. Thanks for having me. I'm, I'm good. I hope I'm not a little oversaturated with this audience as I have been on those chats pretty consistently in the last nine months. I think that well, the Catalyst uh, demographic and market is a completely different segment than the, the PGA chat. So uh, I guarantee you this audience is, is not sick of you. Okay. It's all yours, Craig. Take it away. All right. Well, thank you. Luckily, uh, I think you're going to knock your picture off in a second. We'll be looking at my screen, right? Ah, uh, there we go. Uh, again, uh, for those of you who have been on the chats or those of you who read the SCGA Governmental Affairs, some of what's here today uh, will be redundant, but some things bear repeating, particularly some of these topics I'm going to deal with at the opening of uh, 2021. We're calling this a first week of 2021 snapshot. And uh, if, it, if we would go back a year, and uh, if John says that we did this a year ago, I've done so many things in the last year, I can't really recall. I'm going to bet anything that the 2020 snapshot didn't predict anything that happened in that particular year. So keep that in mind as we go on. One of the things you learn, and, and, my, and also on this broadcast and helping me, is assistant Director of Governmental Affairs at the SCGA, Kevin Fitzgerald. And if there's one thing that we know is that our world can, turn, can be turned upside down at any time of any day of any, of, of any day of the week uh, based upon events. And certainly our world was turned upside down last March and continues to be turned a little bit upside down by, uh, by, uh, by the coronavirus. And I'll deal with that a little bit. This is just roughly what I hope to talk about today. Some of this I'm going to go over, blow over very quickly. For example, the Congressional Relief Bill. Some of it I'll go into some extemporaneous detail, as in the stay at home order. I'm going to go into some deal, detail because this is a group of PGA professionals about some of the really some of the, the some of the wonderful improvements we made with independent contractors in the 2020 session, which was a little counterintuitive. It's hard to it's hard to really for me to grasp that probably golf's most successful legislative year in Sacramento was the year in which they wouldn't let us into the Capitol. Maybe that's our, maybe that should be what we, uh, what our strategy going forward is just not, don't go into the Capitol and we'll end up with a better result. I'm not sure how to take that. I hope I don't take that personally. And then close up a little bit on what we think we're looking at in 2021, at least uh, in the first week of January. We'll see whether the world throws us some, uh, some curveballs moving forward. So, um, there we go. Wait a minute, I'm trying to switch the, uh, the slides, but it's not working. And I'll do my best. The space bar's not working? Yeah, no, it's not. Huh. Well, How about the, the uh, arrow, uh, the right arrow? Well, that's what I hit first, and that's not working either. So we've got the slideshow. Try hitting escape and then spacebar. Right. No, it's not working. Hmm. Let hmm. me, uh, I could probably take, oh, I could, let me, let me pull it up on my end. Okay. And, uh. And then I can drive it. All right. Well, I apologize to everyone. This certainly worked in the dress rehearsal yesterday. It did. It worked last year. I don't know what the problem is. is this where you tell jokes to fill a little time? Nah, not right. like that. Here, I'm going to. Uh... Okay.
Now you still have audio there, Craig, don't you? I yes, I can hear you, and I hope everyone can hear me. Yeah. Do you see uh, you see your cover page on my screen? Yes, I do. I see Director of Governmental Affairs, April 20, 1920, but here we, uh, okay, yeah, that's sort of it. And um, you Okay, we're still on the first, uh, you're still on the first page, weren't you? Yes, I was. Okay, are you ready for the second page? I'm ready for the second page, if you are. Okay, there you go. And now just cue me and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll click it through as you go. Except what you have is an out of date. You have the last time I did this. Oh. It, yeah. Now, for those of you who heard me speak in person, you understand now why I don't have PowerPoint. Sorry, I did that. That is it. Perfect. And now we're going to, okay, we'll go to page two. Okay, there we go. Ah, so I'm going to briefly go through the COVID relief bill. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, spend more time on the regional stay at home order, order but I think it's something important to know. I, I will say that literally, uh, at, you know, related to the, the comments I made at the beginning that the world can change radically uh, on any day of the week, put these slides together a few days ago in absolute anticipation that the odds of the Democrats winning both seats in the state of Georgia were, were not good. It was certainly a possibility, uh, but they were not good. I wouldn't have put money on that. Well, that's what happened. So some of what I'm about, so, so this is the bill as it exists now. Some of the things about this are clear, clearly gonna change and that's almost guaranteed uh, by, uh, by what, what happened, but that won't happen until after uh, January 20th. But anyway, uh, for those of you who are either, this is important as employers or you know, immediately responsible for handling a lot of these issues on behalf of your employer golf club or golf management company, or if your employees, much of this, much of this applies. And so there was a $284.5 billion, you know, addition to the Paycheck Protection Program, which is the forgivable loan program of the original CARES Act. There is a, an unforgivable portion called the EIDL, which we'll get into in a moment, which is also generous, but there's nothing as generous as a forgivable loan. But it does allow You'll notice in the blue, small businesses to receive a second PP loan if the business has less than 300 employees and can demonstrate a revenue reduction of 25%. That's still possible with the absence of food and beverage and some of the ancillary services in a golf course. Yes, play is up, but that doesn't mean the revenue is necessarily up. Um, and, and again, an important thing here uh, expands the PPP eligibility to include 501c6 corporations that is the tax status uh, of the uh, Southern California PGA section, also the Southern California Golf Association. Most PGA sections, most amateur sections in the United States fit that category. I was always hopeful of getting C6s into the bill at some point because that is also the tax status of virtually every chamber of commerce in America. And we have 435 congressional districts and in every one of them, doesn't matter whether you're a Republican, a Democrat, an urban representative or a rural representative, that chamber of commerce, that nonprofit chamber is always a, a, key comp a very important part of your community. And on that basis, we'll get to it in a minute. What's missing from this bill is of the C7s, which are private clubs. I was never optimistic about that and I still, still am not. So a few more details here about the you know, forgiveness it allows employers to deduct the PPP related expenses and it lists the list, you know, the eligible expenses to include those things which are listed. And now John's going to click to the next slide. We hope. Aha. Again, so it, uh, you know, there's a number of features here and these are, and I listed these, these particular bullets because it's a lot of the kinds of details or the questions. Kevin and I guess and get and probably the section gets. Important point here is $20 billion 
is added to the EIDL, and that's going to be the primary program for the private clubs, which are not included in the PPP. There's some issues on extending the repair, repayment period of deferred payroll taxes. That's a question uh, that I got during this and, of course, couldn't answer, so it's answered in the new bill, and I put it here. And I'm sure everyone's aware of the $600 stimulus checks, which you may not be aware is that there is a separate program that's going to be come out in Governor Newsom's budget this week on Friday that adds an, addition six, an additional $600 stimulus check. It's going to be considerably more means tested than this one. This one caps at 75,000 gross adjusted income for individuals, 150,000 for married couples. I haven't seen the details, but I suspect that's going to be a much lower number in California because the aim is very consciously uh, to go towards the first line, the front line workers and those persons that have really been carrying a lot of burden and are being disproportionately infected with the coronavirus uh, in California. And there's a great deal of political uh, support for providing much more support for that component of the population, the, the essential workers, the front line workers, the delivery workers, the people who work in supermarkets. And for those of you who don't, I'll read the headlines, they have been badly affected by the coronavirus, so we'll go from that. Uh, so I uh, wish I could click this thing myself, but John, let's go to another slide. This is the point, key provisions missing, and that would be eligibility in the forgivable loan portion of the program for C7 corporations. That's the tax status of private equity golf clubs and even the, many of the non-equity clubs in, in California. So they will not be eligible for this. I've never thought they would be made eligible. And for those of you who know me well, have understood that I've been a little frustrated with some of uh, the We Are Golf Coalition at the national level for focusing so much on attention on something that was not doable and so little attention on something like the C6s, which were doable. And again, for the persons listening on this broadcast who are members of the PGA section, that was extremely important to your, your section moving forward. Um, now, PGA of America had a different opinion on this, obviously, but they're part of that greater coalition, which represents the entire industry uh, in Washington, D.C. And as you can see, I'm a little frustrated with the way they've represented us here 3,000 miles away. Also missing, uh, which was uh, jettisoned in the bill. These last two items were jettisoned because um, they reached an impasse. Uh, uh, the Republican leader of the Senate was rather adamant that that, uh, that, COVID, that some liability protection be added. Democratic leadership was uh, in both houses was rather adamant that monies for the nation's cash strap, struggling state and local governments be included. And they recognized that the time was gonna run out on unemployment compensation and various other things on December 31st while they, while they reached an impasse on this. So they simply tabled these items uh, moving forward again uh, because of, uh, you know, for those who don't think that elections matter, and even the narrowest of margins of elections don't matter, and who may think that elections in other, uh, two, over 2,000 miles away don't matter, let me suggest to you that that last bullet is, is much more likely to go forward than the, than the second bullet here uh, moving in, in Congress, although I expect both of them to go forward in, a, in some kind of fashion. Uh, and in the, um, in the next congressional session after January 20th. Okay, let's move on, John, to the, to the actual stay-at-home order. Here's a map of California. Here are the five regions under Governor Newsom's new regional stay-at-home order protocol that we entered on December 2nd. Actually, he issued this in late November in anticipation of December being precisely what it's ended up being, which is a COVID-19 disaster, almost statewide, except for that top section, Northern California, and to a lesser extent, the Bay Area, initially all the way voluntarily joined it. But for the two big ones on the South, the Southern California counties, which are the 11, and we're in that, all of you are in that, and the San Joaquin Valley, uh, ours was literally called on December 4th, with less than 48 hours after the protocol was issued, where the threshold for getting into the stay-at-home order was uh, fit when your when your ICU capacity dropped below 15%, um, then 
and, and we collapsed very, very quickly based upon the thing, based upon what happened over Thanksgiving and probably what happened a little bit prior to that as the weather changed. Um, so the way this protocol operates is that initially it was put into effect for a three week period, which took it to December 28th. Every week it has to be renewed um, and it is renewed unless, unless for a period, of, if I understood the following calculation, I'm not the only one who does and I'll try to explain it, but if you don't understand it, don't worry, nobody understands it and everyone's seeking clarification. But the ICU capacity has to be projected to be restored over that 15% number for a fixed period, set period of time. And if you look at the language, it's not clear what that set period of time is, but what is, and it has to be reviewed weekly, but what is clear is that we're going to be in the stay at home order, at least in the 11 Southern California counties for a long time to come. I've written down here at least four to eight weeks. It could be slightly longer than that. Uh, there had been some hope a couple of weeks ago that the vaccines would proliferate a lot faster than they have, um, but that hasn't happened yet either. Maybe that'll get sped up. That will certainly help us get out of it. And the degree to which persons don't travel and don't congregate and aggregate, it'll happen faster. Um, but, uh, but our hospitals are, are reaching a critical stage. And so um, if we click that slide, we'll be able to continue on. Ah, so what this explains, and, and I want to indicate that this, that I've distilled this down for what this means for golf. And I'm going to go into some detail here as to how the sausage was, was made. I want to emphasize that these bullet points, and I'm going to specifically read them, is a general set of bullet points. This is sort of the common denominator among the 11 counties. There are differences. I need to sort of warn you about that. So depending on whether you're in Los Angeles County or Riverside County, and what I've generally put here is, is the, the standard protocols of how this is being interpreted in Los Angeles County because it's the strictest of the 11. So if you're following these things, you're following it in your county as well. And that first bullet is a little tortured and I'll explain why, and it's important to understand why. What it means is no more than four individuals playing per prior reservation in intervals of no less than 10 minutes. That may seem a tortured way of saying that you can put four, you put foursomes out 10 minutes apart, uh, but keep in mind that when the governor issued this language very quickly, and it was published on December 2nd as part of the regional stay at home order, he spoke in terms of outdoor recreation, bundled everything together, pickleball, tennis, all kinds of things in there. I, I can't enumerate them all. Golf was specifically referenced as one of the permitted outdoor activities. He uh, re referred to individuals or members of a household. Well, you know, individuals can't play tennis or pickleball or a number of other things, so it seemed to almost be a contradictory non-starter going out. But Golf can be played. We, everyone on this call is played as a single late in an afternoon. Uh, and keeping in mind that at the dawn of the pandemic, literally that was the language used in Northern California, the Bay Area County of Santa Clara. And for a couple of days, literally there was one public golf course that made a mockery of it by putting singles out in two minute intervals until they invited public health out to look at this and public health changed things around. But the governor issued that language and the counties are required to consider that language minimum. So for a period of a few days, uh, the major jurisdiction, Los Angeles County was holding to that. And the golf courses, uh, the public golf courses anyway, I'm not sure what all the private clubs did. They were panicking, but they did what they did. Um, literally were, were, were felt they needed to follow that. And of course, play collapsed if only members of household could, could make reservations. I'm not gonna explain in detail how this was done, but ultimately, the way the way LA County Public Health defined what that meant was this, no more than four individuals playing for prior reservation in intervals of no less than 10 minutes. Uh, luckily, with all hell breaking loose and with all of the problems, I, I consider that golf was very fortunate to be able to get public health in LA County with 10 million, 10.2 million souls and what is now the ground zero of the worst COVID-19 cases in the nation, 
to reinterpret this so that it made some common sense, uh, which is one of the reasons why I've been counseling consistently. We ought to just we ought to just be quiet now. Now is not the time to raise any more concerns or issues. Be grateful that we can do this and move forward. The other things are clear, no congregating, crowding, including parking lot tailgating. There was one golf course that was inspected. It passed the inspection in, in LA County that I'm aware of, except they discovered some of the patrons out in the parking lot were congregating and they were cited, they, were, they weren't cited for that. It was simply suggested that they needed to monitor that and they have. Obviously food beverage is restricted to takeout. I think everyone knows that. Cart occupancy is all over the map. Technically in Los Angeles County, which I, you know, I said was the strictest, double occupancy is permitted with plexiglass dividers. Many golf courses are not following that because they're discovering that with the case loads as they are, a lot of golfers are not comfortable doing that. Um, individual golf instruction is permitted and group uh, uh, of, of six or less under certain conditions is permitted in some counties. Uh, face coverings are required wherever and whenever six feet of separation from others cannot be guaranteed. What that pretty much means is that face covering should either be on, it could obviously if somebody's in the, you know, uh, in the middle of the fourth fairway, 150 yards away from any of their uh, fellow competitors or fellow players, uh, you, know, you slip it down, it's not a big deal, but anywhere in a clubhouse, a parking lot, or in a first tee, or even while on a green or a tee, highly suggest that those face coverings be on, and then that be part of the protocols, or at least the rules listed at a golf club or golf facility. And obviously, um, to, to all of those who probably call you and say, why can't we have bunkers in the ra rakes in the bunkers? What about flag sticks and so forth? Let's let that sleeping dog lie. And then I always feel the obligation, no matter the forum, to, sit, to put this following. Golf's ability to play under these general rules for the duration of the pandemic is entirely dependent upon golfers and golf facilities scrupulously adhering to all rules governing permitted outdoor recreation under the regional order and maintaining the game's exemplary record in avoiding the spread of the virus. Golf's record has been very good. My understanding uh, that it's been explained to me on some of the internal discussions with various public health departments and in discussions more directly with those public health departments that do talk to organized golf is that that fact, that last line about the fact that golf has had an excellent record as compared to some other, not just industries, but some other outdoor activities um, is entirely continue. It, it, puts, it puts us in, in good stead and they are very um, willing to uh, continue to accommodate us even as I hope everyone understands that the caseloads are going to get worse before they get better, but they will get better. Um, so John, if you'll, you'll uh, punch a slide, we'll continue on here. Ah. So we're done with the regional stay at home order. I'm sure that John is, uh, is capturing some questions and we'll leave some time at the end to answer any that this presentation raised. Yes, indeed. This is a, uh, going to go through, again, it's the beginning of a year, key new laws. This one, the rest of them all came in on January 1. Uh, this one didn't. This one was effective immediately last uh, late August, I suppose, or the, yeah, yeah, late August. It was uh, passed by both houses of the legislature and signed by the governor, and it was effective then. AB 2257, that's really AB 5. Let me go back for a little bit of history. All of you are aware of how we were rattled by, by a California Supreme Court decision called Dynamex uh, back in 2018 that seemed to upend, uh, upended the leading case out of 1989 that created an 11 brawn test for what's an independent contractor and what's not in all, in all businesses and industries, or at least those who pay, you know, at least those who like golf, uh, uh, paid heed to the law and respected it. Some didn't, and that's part of the problem. That's why we have AB5, because many didn't respect it. Uh, so, um, you know, upended everything and almost, uh, in, you know, issued a, issued a three-part test for independent contracting that pretty much ended all independent contracting, according to the middle prong. Uh, and that required the legislature in the process of codifying that, also to clarify it, to permit some independent contracting. Uh, well, we got caught in a, 
and a firestorm of who run, you know, of, of politics really in 2019. It became a, a battle of wills as to who runs the state. And uh, I knew who was going to win that battle. It's organized labor. Now the population in the ballot uh, just uh, in this last November kind of uh, uh, blew, fought back a little bit on Prop 22. And I'll get to what that does mean or doesn't mean for the golf. And it means almost nothing for the golf industry. But it did mean something, I think, for the political dynamic moving forward. Indicated that maybe so maybe the legislature was a little out of step with those they are purporting to represent, at least on that issue, and probably a couple of other issues as well, including property taxes. But in a year in which, you know, a year ago, if I was giving this presentation, I would have stated that we were as pleased as we were that we managed to get meetings uh, with the author of AB5 and that we managed to get, get within a business to business for professionals exception, a test that made it possible under some perhaps slightly changed conditions to continue independent contracting uh, for PGA professionals. We stated that at that time, you could forget it about caddies, um, that as much as that, it was imperfect. And our number one legislative goal in 2020 was to perfect that. Well, we couldn't get into the capital and, and the capital became consumed with a 50 with a uh, with a surplus that quickly became a deficit as the economy shut down due to COVID-19 and because of COVID-19 and the fact that the two houses of the legislature were never in sac were never in town so it was impossible to get in i lowered everyone's expectations and simply said it will we'll have to wait till at least 2021 to do those things well i was wrong about that it turns out at the end of the session through a gut and amend bill a lot of the things that um we had hoped for, we had hoped to work for, and probably we're going to work for beyond 2020, uh, were what I would what I've characterized as three major improvements for our game and industry. Uh, a pathway was created for the use of independent contracting, caddies through the auspices of a third party uh, protocol. I won't go into the details on that because it's fairly complicated. There's some private businesses that have filled the niche and they provide that, they provide that, and a number of, I'm, I'm aware, a number of private clubs are using those particular services. I was completely pessimistic about that possibility. Wrong again, glad to be wrong on some of these things, uh, but that ended up. Uh, sports, youth sports coaches were specifically exempted. That's really important, whether it's uh, for SCGA Junior Golf Foundation or Northern California's uh, you know, pro program. In, so, and, um, or many of the programs that the SCPGA and NCPGA operate make use of these coaches. And that is something that I was hopeful for, but just not in, in 2020. And then for the PGA professionals, um, and I've listed the bullets here, there were four areas out of the 12 prong tests that were we considered problematic. They could be overcome. Uh, and a couple of them were just minor issues, were minor problems, but three of the four were completely cured in changing and I and so and I've listed them. AB5's original requirement regarding separate business locations was replaced by the ability to maintain a residence as that separate business location. We were doing that by by implication because in other parts of the bill you could do that, but it wasn't specifically within the business to business for professional services exception. Now it is. Uh, AB5 originally had a requirement that the independent contract independent contractor contract with other businesses uh, actually give evidence of that. And I know that tripped up a few, uh, in a few examples that came to my attention of people, of professionals who called me. And it's been replaced by the mere ability to contract with other businesses, which is a much lower standard. Uh, and that is gonna, that solved one of the things that we found problematic. And the new test, prong six, makes clear in a way that the old test did not that the provider, in other words, the PGA professional uh, services may be engaged in independent establishments of the same nature as that involved in the work performed. That was the problem with Dynamex from the beginning. If there was any relationship between what was purported to be an independently contracted service or provision of service and, and the business itself. So we were always tripped up on how can the teaching of golf not be set, how can that be separate from a golf facility? Well, now that's not a problem moving forward. There is still, eh, flip the slide now, John, and, and uh, apologize for having to say that periodically. 
John's distracted. He's not flipping the slide. There we go. So, um, and then I pointed out that the one part of the test that still continues, I, I think, to bother us, and that's our number one legislative goal or one of our legislative goals in, in 2021, uh, is this particular language, which is a little complicated and convoluted. And I'll suggest that it's easy to work your way around, and you could specifically work around it in a written agreement. I'd recommend that. Uh, but um, as I stated here, that is uh, that is the last thing. What we thought was going to be a much more ambitious task in 2021 or even 2022 uh, became this this very narrow task on this uh, particular issue. So if you flip the slide, now we have less text moving forward and just some simple things that went into effect on January 1 that I want to share with you that I feel should be part of this presentation and should be part of your knowledge base. So that was a clue, John, to hit the button. This is a slight delay. Notice right now with companies with five or more employees are required to provide up to 12 weeks of unpaid job leave to care for a newborn, newly adopted child, sick family member, and family members defined beyond spouses and children to include grandparents, grandchildren, siblings, and in-laws. This is one of the many what I would call COVID-19 pieces of legislation that passed and are effective. It's aimed at that, but this one will be permanent, unlike one or two, that one that we're gonna to get to in a moment, which will time out at the end of the pandemic. You need to know that whether you're an employee or an, or, or in the, or an employer, and, and many of you are in both positions. So let's click to the next one. And this you'll all need to pay close attention to, and that's notifications. So businesses must notify employees within one business day of learning of any potential COVID-19 exposure, and at the same time notify them of all information regarding benefits, workers' compensation, the sick leave I just talked about, protection against retaliation and virus protection measures. And then you must also notify local public health agencies within 48 hours of a COVID-19 outbreak, which is defined for the purposes of this particular bill as three lab confirmed cases at a single workplace within a two week period. This is the new protocols as of January 1 that we're operating under now. And then we'll get to a, maybe I think what is the last one or the second to last one on the next slide. And, uh, there, has, there was a lot of discussion of this uh, last year. Um, at the dawn of the pandemic, Governor Newsom issued a, an executive order that created it, that he called it a rebuttable presumption, which is the usual phrase um, that any frontline worker who contracted COVID-19 uh, caught it on the job unless, unless the business, that's the idea, rebutted the presumption with proof. In other words, it shifted the burden of proof for demonstrating that the uh, the, in other words, the, the, if the, the employer would have to, if you got COVID-19, the presumption was you got it on the job and the burden of proof shifted to the employer to demonstrate otherwise, which meant tough tax. Um, there was a bill floated that would have created an absolute presumption, as a, not even given the businesses the possibility to rebut. That was the assembly version. The Senate version was this disputable presumption. And ultimately, this is the one uh, that prevailed uh, because the governor preferred it. It does time out, uh, obviously, because COVID-19 times out. And I didn't put, and I, and I, and I apologize for not knowing the time, but it's available. There you go, look it up, SB 1159. You, uh, you can see it in there. Now let's flip and see if the, the last, I think one more new law, that, or well, not so much that. This is not a new law. These laws were put into effect some years, a few years ago. Everyone remembers it. It's just that they were on January 1, uh, a new minimum wage was uh, triggered, and that's $14 per hour. This is the statewide standard $14 per hour for employers with more than 25 employees, 13 for employers with less than with 25 or fewer. But I have to point out a lot of jurisdictions in this state have higher minimums. For example, the city and county of LA will reach their $15 uh, max out and then a CPI applies to it on July 1. 
um, I believe Pasadena, and there are probably some other cities within the state, has already reached that $15 as of, of January 1. So you need to check your jurisdiction. It's part of doing business, and it's uh, part of and, and golf business, watching those water rates, which isn't even on here. I probably I'll, may have a comment at the end if there's a minute uh, about water. Isn't that amazing how times have changed? Water dominated these discussions just a few years ago. And uh, for any, if we're lucky, maybe it'll continue raining and snowing and they won't dominate them moving um, sort of forward. So uh, let's kind of move on. That's a clue to hit the slide. There we go. So uh, a little bit more time uh, to speak, I think, extemporaneously, and then leave a little time uh, for some questions um, at the end. Again, uh, the legislature was scheduled to go back into session this week, and they didn't because of the caseloads in Sacramento. So who knows? I'm going to issue the same cautionaries and lower everyone's expectations of the degree to which that remains true and the degree to which there's so much focus on COVID-19, the disease itself, responding to it, all kinds of forms of relief and so forth, really obviates our ability to do some of the narrow things that we want to do. I said this a year ago, and then we had a great legislative year as, as far as, you know, compared to some of the others. Um, and keeping in mind that we're at that time right now where it's extraordinarily important on what the snow levels are in the Sierra Nevadas and in the Colorado Basin. That was a little problematic. Uh, there's been a little bit of help. Mother Nature gave us a little bit of relief, but that's something we always need to pay attention to. For those of you who are listening to this, who are involved in budgets at all, uh, you know that, uh, that the price of water is something and the access to water is something which is uh, is an acute problem for the golf industry and something we always need to track. But again, we're at the mercy of a lot of a lot of things. I will say it's a little bit into the weeds, but since John, since our, our host here on the Catalyst is from Monterey Country Club in, in, um, in Palm Desert, I will say that probably the one place in the state in, in which the golf industry is, is probably best positioned in terms of being a partner in developing, in, in the case of the desert, uh, the, the new Coachella Valley Water Management Plan, in terms of all kinds of issues, is right there. It's not an accident. Um, I made it my business to make it a high priority some years ago. The 121 golf courses are there, so fully 25% of the golf clubs, of the golf courses in the Southern California Golf Association are in that tightly packed area. It's extraordinarily important to the game. I'm happy to report that um, that a situation that I think had some issues and problems and had some political problems, some public relations problems, and particularly some media problems like five or six, seven years ago, uh, don't have any of those problems. And, and that outlook going forward is excellent. And I think it's a good roadmap uh, for doing this in lots of other places in the state. I'm sorry, that's a little bit of an aside. I put the California Alliance for Golf on here because I think the, the organization in the last year or so found its way develop some stability, has a little money in the bank, very little, I might add, and, but, and it seems to be resolved now around, uh, around the understanding that it needs to ramp up its efforts significantly and substantially because the golf industry, well, for two reasons. First of all, to the degree to which it has been, it has been involved, it's been extremely effective. And, and I think golf is beginning to recognize if you could add resources to that and expand it, um, the, the effectiveness would be that much more. And golf's going to need to be effective. And that's where I'm going to sort of close uh, with some comments about that, which are a bit generic. Um, they're a little bit, they may be counterintuitive, and they may strike you, some of you, as strange. But I'm going to be talking, I've been talking about them a lot, and I'm going to continue. Golf has had got a, we all got shocked by COVID-19. And I think when it first hit, I'm gonna guess a lot of persons on this call, I certainly was one of them, predicted really bad things for the golf industry. 
that, that would, if we re, even when we reopen, would people play? Or in the case of the Southern California Golf Association, why would people re-up in golf clubs? Uh, you know, if, if they really, they can't play competitions, it's truncated, will they even play? Dead wrong on all of that. And as excited as we are about that, I wanna make clear that the feature of our game, and that's a very definite and unique feature of the game, which served us beautifully during this pandemic, is the exact same feature which is going to cause us the great, which is going to cause us the greatest problems moving forward, and the pandemic will end. So that moving forward is something we need to strap ourselves in for in for now, and it's this. And I actually did the number because I had a, an interest in coming up with this following with this following number, because Kevin and I were, you know, we were charged with dealing with 11 different county public health systems that didn't really want to talk to us. That's, a, that's an interesting experience. But you have to like rejection to do this job. And that is the following. Under those rules, under all those protocols I discussed a few slides ago, under the regional stay at home order, the rules under which golf is being played right now and is permitted. If you max it out in the middle of the day, so you've got the maximum number of group of individuals and in four groups of four, 10 minutes apart. What you do is put 1.3 human beings on one acre of open space with a face covering on. That was very that is a very compelling fact to share with public health officials. It makes them understand that about the safest thing you can do other than staying in your house alone, assuming you live alone is to play golf. And we and they have to they have to permit something. And that's the that's the statistic, the very fact about our game, which allows us to continue playing. And so you know, if you're trying to get a tea time on a public facility right now, you can't. Greatest complaint we hear is that the that the, the these computerized reservation systems in the uh, municipal system must be fixed or must be gained because I can never get a time. Um, music to the ears if you're in the golf industry, but you know, for a golfer, it becomes a little bit frustrating. And that's an indication of just how bulging the demand is. And that all sounds great. But the truth is that putting 1.3 human beings in a maxed out situation on one acre is our big, is our Achilles heel. Because with land becoming so precious, so expensive, with competition from every, lots of recreational groups, competition from environmental groups, competition from land conservancy, the US Tennis Association, I'm not gonna go into the details of that, but it didn't bother them coming into Southern California to invade a golf property. Golf would never have done that to tennis. And that's a, that's a discussion we'll have when they make the invasion. Um, and with all of the claims and all of the desire, when you, when you, when you, now that that statistic is out there, that is simply not only too few people on too much land, those too few people only play golf. And that makes us so vulnerable to being this elitist activity that commands way too much space. Yes, we're environmentally sustainable and all the wonderful, but then again, so are soccer fields, or let's talk about Palm Springs again. So would be a desert preserve where Tockwitz has been for 60 years, because that's a can't, that is, and that is something that, that is a, a fight that's going on right now. And those fights, it, and, and as I told everyone, if you could see what I see every day, hear what I hear every day, read what I read every day, and have to confront every day all those groups that cover this property. And those groups will, are, will extend beyond just recreational groups and open space groups, Quite honestly, yeah, development developers of long coveted golf courses, and if they're if they're privately owned, you can't make a private uh, club sell it. If it's public parkland, yeah, there's a Park Preservation Act. But I warn everyone that a couple of years ago there was a bill floated in the assembly that would have created another exception in the Park Preservation Act. Those exceptions now are police, fire, major highways, and in this case, as the as the author of the, the, the failed bill put it, so we could take these useless public golf courses in my district and put them to good use, which is affordable housing. Um, that, 
you know, and if you take a look at the political atmosphere, the political environment right now, just read and listen and so forth, understand that that is a very compelling argument. So when you have these large swaths, and to those of you who work in the private sector involved or private clubs, no, it doesn't matter what the Park Preservation Act, doesn't matter if someone covets your property, it's private property, you don't have to sell it. But I hope everyone understands that, it, that with Prop 15, which was, the, which was the failed proposition by a margin of 52 to 48 on the November California ballot, that would have, that, that would have upended Prop 13 for non-residential property, which would have included private golf clubs. Uh, but private golf clubs are protected in the California Constitution. It's Article 13, Section, it's Article 10, Section 13, if you want to look it up which has special dispensation on its property taxes as sort of privately owned park land or open space, an, an interesting anachronism. Um, but that can be un upended too. Keep in mind that, can't take it away from you, but those special dispensations that keep your property taxes low in the, inter in the societal interest of green space, um, they may say, that's fine, you're rich and you own what you own, but we're gonna make you pay for it. So again, and, and that's out there, and, and I see it, I hear it, I know it, I know there are tax organizations that are just burned up at the property taxes that private clubs pay in the state of California. I warned all the clubs and most listen, don't get involved in that fight on Prop 15 because it really doesn't affect you and you're simply going to stick your nose up in it. You're going to stick your nose up into something that's going to get it, get, 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 and you just don't want the world knowing this. But at all levels, that 1.3 human beings, whether they own the place, it's a different set of challenges, but particularly the uh, public parkland golf course, otherwise known as a municipal golf course, keep in mind 22% of the golf courses in this state are owned by governments. And they're the ones where, and about 40, over 40% 40 of the actual play occurs on those golf courses, and over 90% of all the, de all the developmental programs, all those things that this section it does so laudably, the SCGA does, the First T does, all those programs, those are occurring on that 22% stock. That's where the developmental facilities are. If those come under attack, we lose the entry points, we lose all, we lose all those sites where we hope to grow the game. I, I'll just you know, finish on, on uh, keep in mind that to finish on a simpler line, it's hard to grow something if you don't have somewhere to grow it. We need that space. We need those places. We are, and we, and many of the groups that are assaulting golf are well-funded, well-organized, well-heeled, and well-established. Whether it's land for public trust, which just happens to be one of them that likes to look at golf courses, because why, why bundle? Why bundle 42 tracts of property when you can go after 150 acres in one fell swoop and, uh, and, and use public money to do it in many cases? So I conflated the two, you know, keep in mind, let's, let's obviously try to keep as much of that play that came to us. I mean, we all know that during the pandemic, we, a lot of new players came out. We need to keep them. And you guys are the ones on the front line of that. And a lot of persons who were playing more sporadically are paying, playing more regularly. We need to work to keep them. But at the same time, recognize that as that demand explodes, golf course, there's the expense of buying the property and building a golf course, unless you're building abandoned dunes type place, it's gonna charge you an extraordinary amount, amount of money in the middle of nowhere as a destination site. We simply not, we, we don't have the wherewithal to build these things. So as they close, they're never coming back and we lose the build, we lose the sites where we can grow this game and, and continue to prosper. Um, and that's why that second bullet here on this last slide, where, where from here, I think there's a recognition that, that maybe for much of our history, uh, events took us, it was an expanding middle class, uh, government support of golf courses. Keep in mind, most municipal golf courses were built with taxpayer money. Um, and then they were sustained with taxpayer money, and that was simply considered the provision. That's a, we don't have that model anymore. It doesn't exist. The game, the game became sufficiently successful in part because of those public investments that we ended up with a very, very different and more businesslike structure. 
but as some of those lose their traction and don't no longer make business sense, and as, and as others, which may make perfect business sense, but simply the politics of the situation are that other, is the public has decided uh, we just want to use it for some other more laudable purpose. And then there are groups out there that have that come to the money, come to the table with money to help finance those changes. Golf doesn't have those pots of gold to come to it. Golf doesn't have a lot of things. And it's like anything in life. When you're buoyed along by, you know, by events and things are going extremely well, you become complacent. And in this regard, the game has become very complacent. I may sound, so, I, so I'm sounding this alarm at the end of this presentation because, because, I, I, because there's, a, there's a, a satisfaction and a complacency built in by this sort of unmerited bounty that came out of COVID-19. And I apologize for the bad taste in that to refer to something in which probably by the time we get to the end, over half a million Americans will have lost their lives to this and many more will have been damaged and businesses will have been destroyed and lives will have been destroyed and budgets will have been destroyed. Uh, so, but in essence, as it turned out to be, it turned out to be golf's greatest growth program, ironically, and I know we'll work our best to keep it, but at the same time, the very reason for that is also the thing which was causing us the greatest problems before and will cause us the greatest problems thereafter. With that, I promised I'd leave a little time at the end of this to answer all the, to answer all the confusion I raised in this uh, rapid presentation. And so I'm going to do that and John and ask uh, if there are any questions at the end. Indeed there are. Thank you very much, Craig. Can you elaborate a little bit on Prop 13? You said it would be upended. Uh, I think a lot of us don't know what Prop 13 is. Proposition 13 uh, passed by the voters in 1978, which, um, depending on how you look at it, uh, stabilized the property tax model in the state of California so that every, every parcel was to be assessed at that time and, and thereafter at, at 1975 valuations and go up uh, no more than 1% or is it 2% per year thereafter under the, under the current owner. So if you owned a home in 1978, this passes, and, you, and 20 years later, you, the, you, you knew that your taxes would only go up very, a very, very small amount uh, because in the inflation of the 1970s, the, the home values were being reassessed at astronomical rates, but that didn't mean the people who lived in them had the income to pay the taxes, and it became, and, and the legislature did what it often does, it sat and did nothing for a period of time, so the voters took it into their own hands. Over time, it, it's, it's a model that applies across the board, and a lot of um, businesses found ways to always structure sales, because when you sell the property, it then gets reassessed according to those values and the new owners take them, which meant that we've often have people in California who live next door to each other in homes that look alike, and one person's paying eight times more in, in property taxes than the other. That's created some anomalies over the year. What has always bothered certain uh, persons in California, and it really irritates those in progressive tax groups, is that major, major landholders and businesses have found ways to um, structure sales so that it net, so never 50% plus one tran owner title transfers, and so the taxes remain locked in place. So over time, homeowners have paid more and more of a percentage of the property taxes than that. Prop 15 on this last ballot would have separate, would have kept all those protections for residences, for, for homes, but eliminated them for non-residential properties. Now, golf courses are non-residential, but they're not businesses either. And in the state of California, private clubs are, are, are protected in the Constitution literally by, another, by a 1960 voter initiative that was passed by the voters and almost taxed as next to an open space practically. Now that's the golf course portion. If there's a business portion in a clubhouse, that's a little bit different. It's a little bit complicated. Now, technically, daily fee properties don't fall under that, but we discovered that with the exception of one county in California, which is in the northern part of the state, for the most part, 
the, the assessors just looked at a daily fee course and assessed its values, the, the golf course properties, the same as they did private clubs. And that's something that would have been upended, I think, as well if Prop 15 had passed. Pointing out, though, that Prop 15 didn't fail by much, but it did fail. Uh, it got 48% of the vote. And I can say that the, and, and, and you can see the movement at some point is to eliminate that. So I, I just, I think it's important. And I know the SCGA and, and the California Alliance for Golf put out this rather extensive white paper. You give, me, give me a call, give me an email, I'll be happy to share it with you. It explains in excruciating detail uh, what the implications of Prop 15 would be. And in, in that detail, it had it passed. And in that detail, what the actual, what the realities are of, of the tax burdens. So that for a, for example, for a private beach club, uh, Prop 15 would have been devastating because they would have been reassessed uh, for their real valuation and it would have been a disaster. Uh, for a private downtown club, I'd say the same thing. For a private country club, not so much. Yes, it would go up to the degree to which a minimum of every three years they'd be reassessed, but they wouldn't be reassessed as commercial property. They'd be reassessed practically uh, as the status that the, the voters gave them in 1960. I hope that answered the question. It's a very complicated question. And as with so many things uh, in government and law, and particularly with taxation, they are complicated questions, which is one of the reasons I become, I personally become frustrated when certain organizations try to simplify that and worse, try to scare you into, into raising money for something that maybe you could save your money for something else. I hope I answered the question. Yes, indeed you did. Now, Craig, you talked about uh, the 1.3 human beings per one acre of land being our Achilles heel. Is that uh, because it's too much space and we need more bodies in such a, such a uh, space to, to exercise the game? No, it's, it, 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 the, the beauty of the game is, is, I mean, I think that one of the great pulls of the game is that it, it's out in nature and you get away from the world and so forth. And that's why we love it. We play it Why a lot of people love it and play it and it's treasured and it's been protected over the years. But when you get into the large cities and now almost into the suburbs and you get one report after the next about park poor areas, you see that uh, little leagues don't have nowhere to go, particularly as schools close and deny them and, and soccer fields. And, and so the pull, and, and the, all of those activities are predominantly for kids and, and, and the popular and politically people see parks as primarily for young people first. Golf course, as much as we love our junior programs, when you visit a golf course during the week, you see people who are past, well past a certain age. There's certainly not many kids out there. And so it becomes almost as why are we dedicating so much space that we own, that's in the public sector, and I'll get to the private in a minute, that we own to so few people who are so spread out when we could change the use and allow far, these are the arguments that every, every time a golf course is subject to some kind of repurposing, the argument is we can make our publicly owned land available to so many more communities and so many more people if we simply repurpose it. In terms, and I tried to indicate that this is not just a concern for the public, but also for the private, because the whole rationale, and you know, I, I actually went back and read the 1960 uh, ballot arguments uh, for, for, the, for the initiative that, in essence, uh, created a very, very benign assessment basis for private golf clubs in California. It's just golf clubs, it's not other kinds of clubs in California. And it was very much an open space argument and interestingly, it was an argument that was going to protect, prevent overcrowding at what they referred to as the public links golf facilities. And, was, and the lead ballot argument was written by one of the lions of the left in California history, Gus Hawkins. This was not a, this was not a business or conservative argument that carried the day in 1960. It was very much the same arguments that are now being used against us. Shame on golf for losing sight, losing that strand and losing that political support. That's all I'll say about that because we sure could use it now and we could have been able to use it in recent years. So all those polls are, are, to, are to more to, to uses of, of land that applies to more people. And again, 
you know, we chafe at the notion that golfers are all elite. We say, my God, you go to a public golf course, it looks, looks, it looks just like the communities in which the golf courses are located. That's true. But what it doesn't have is many people from the community on it. And that, again, that is, that is a political problem. You know, there is, for those of you who are familiar with the mile square issue in Orange County, and by the way, it's on delay because of COVID-19. That, that, so, and know that there are two extremely successful regulation golf courses in that park. And one of them is slated to close. I'm not gonna go into all the reasons. And that project is called an expansion of the park property. Now, I'm so naive when I went to the original, I went to a public meeting and I said, where are you gonna expand Mile Square Park? All around it is development, homes and businesses. Exactly where is this expansion? And they looked at me and said, well, we're, we're, uh, we're getting rid of one of the golf courses. I said, well, how does that expand your parkland? Well, we're, we're, we're turning into parklands. I said, your golf course is a parkland. By the way, at least in many, most other places in this state, they do regard it as such. But I want people to understand that's the mindset out there. People don't, they see the golf course as something exclusive. They see fences around. We know the fences are there because it's not safe to hit a golf ball out onto a street or into somebody's house. But, uh, but the world sees those fences and sees those places as stay out unless you play golf. And it's true. We don't like the, we don't let people walk their dogs in the middle of the fairway. Again, it's a safety problem. I'm saying in so many different ways, we have to pay close attention to, to, it, to finding every way possible to point out how our golf facilities benefit communities. And we better be transparent and honest about those things and not those simple bullet points that I see in some of these kinds of presentations. Because we're on the defensive here and, and we better, I, I just want everyone to understand that moving forward. Because again, you see different things. Many of you see bad golf swings like, like people like from me and, and, and like, can you cure me? And you think, oh my God, how do I tell this guy the truth? What I see is very, very different. And I see, all, I see and maybe I have a bit of a cop's view of the world in the sense that every day I'm confronted by all those things but you need to know they're out there. And this is, this is our key, I would call it our existential problem, is what, what is a great pull for the game is, is, is our Achilles heel in cities and suburbs. And uh, final question here, Craig. Can you talk a little more in layman's terms about how much more beneficial AB 2257 is for the independent contractor versus uh, its predecessor, AB5? Yeah. Um, it, that in the, in the 12 prong test, in, what, what, in the exception in which PGA professionals fit, keeping in mind that I know some people wanted to get exemption and it's very difficult for the state the state to exempt something it doesn't can't define or license and i don't think pga professionals want to be licensed to the state of california so you can't define what does that mean what it means is a non-governmental group that terms it pga of america so pga professionals fit under this business to business for professional services exception and it had the language in four of the 12 prong test, whether you qualified, had various problems in it. A couple of them had were minorly problematic. I don't think even AB5 was sufficiently protective of the ability that was some slightly changed agreements. It continued forward uh, in 2020 under AB5. And I know even some of the management groups that were reluctant to do it at the beginning or really said they wouldn't do it under AB5 ended up figuring out, what, out a way to do it. Ultimately, I think they had to sit down with, with council in order to structure it. And if the professionals were willing to restructure and the facility was willing to restructure, you could do it. AB2257 eliminated some of those things such as a separate pace of business or doing business elsewhere. It just have to have the capacity so if you have an LLC or just simply have a, a business license and you have the capacity in your agreement with where you are contracting to teach that you can go to another facility, doesn't mean you have to. Under old AB5, 
it was almost an implication that you had to have more than one contract in order to be an independent contractor. Now you don't. So there are various improvements in there. There's one piece, it's prong two for those who look it up, that still I think causes, I don't think it would, in other words, it's, I don't think it's gonna cause any problems for any facility or any professional who wants to work as an independent contractor, but why not perfect something if we have the opportunity and eliminate all doubt? And, I, and, and so that, I hope that answers answered the question. And if you know how to contact me, be happy to, because you're asking a question that really, really should be, in, I should give you a written answer and, and, spe and, give, and show to you exactly how it does those kinds of things. It's difficult off the top of my head. And I'm loath to say something off the top of my head that might misinform or be on a tape that misses, misinforms. I hope that's about as good as I can do on that. No, that's pretty darn good. Uh, Craig, on behalf of the Education Committee for the uh, SoCal section of the PGA, thank you very much for coming on and presenting on the Catalyst webinar series. We do appreciate it. For everybody on the, uh, on the webcast this morning, we are going to send out uh, the PDF form of Craig's presentation so that you have those facts and figures in front of you. And of course, Craig's contact information is on there. If you have a little more uh, granular question for him or need a little more clarification, feel free to reach out to him. He's uh, there to help us. And uh, everybody have a great day. Thank you very much for being on the Catalyst. Craig. Thank you very much. Take care, everybody. Stay safe. Stay sane. Thank you. Thank you.